How do you go from selling dumbbells out of your garage to designing, manufacturing and installing state-of-the-art gym facilities for the planet's most successful sporting organisations? How do you go from a solitary sign on Belfast Sormo Road to a globally renowned brand and team of 75 skilled professionals? This is the story of Greg Bradley and Black Box. Yeah, I guess if I look back to childhood, yeah, my parents were self-employed. They didn't run their own businesses per se, but yeah, they were they were self-employed. Um, and yeah, I think they, if I look back, they were very encouraging to me. They didn't really push me down any one direction. Um, I think even a lot of my friends probably did come from more of a wealthier background and subconsciously or that may have just planted a seed. Um, we were more of a slightly working class background and I think that's actually a big advantage um, when you look at some of the most successful CEOs and business owners a lot have came from working class backgrounds and I feel it's a competitive advantage. It gives you a drive. Yeah well I actually used to sell uh, Northwest 200 um, programs and that was paid I think the program was 10 pound and you got a pound for everyone you sold so again you know it's quite a good way because you only get paid for results and that's what we try to talk about as well within the team you know yes effort is good and good intentions are good but equally all you do you get paid for is results so yeah I did that when I was maybe every year from 10 to 14 um, and then yeah throughout university I actually used to buy and sell Abercrombie & Fitch um, clothes and I used to buy it in on bulk and then sell on eBay and other places um, that was to feed uh, social, very active social life going out four or five nights a week um, and yeah again that gave me a bit of a taste and of business through university I had no plans to go work for a different company I didn't know what I was going to do but I remember I think maybe someone came in from Gen Reaction Cycles and maybe did a, a talk and I remember just kind of thinking god that company's global and they're based in Northern Ireland you know so that planted a, a seed for me um, and then I, I graduated somehow from, from university and I was planning to go to the Lions. It was in New Zealand and then I just had this idea. I played Gaelic football and we were quite an athletic team. We had a good culture of going to the gym and we won a senior championship that year against the odds. Um, and then I just thought I was trying to source equipment, my club probably a couple of years before I actually got a grant for a gym and I felt that the equipment that was provided to them I felt that they were taking advantage of because they knew it was a sport NI grant and they just could sell it sell and forget and I was just like there has to be something better out there and there really wasn't that much at the time so yeah I put up some pictures onto adverts.ie of equipment which I just downloaded from Google and then people started to ring me and with the benefit of hindsight you know it was a great book Lean Startup and that's kind of what it was I hadn't read that book at the time but I think in business sometimes people can fall in love with their ideas and think they have the best idea without actually getting feedback and testing the market so for me I was able to get feedback without actually having to spend any money whatsoever um, and then I had to figure out how to <laughs> supply the equipment, but that's a, a different story. First order, I guess I had downloaded pictures of um, it's like sleds and prowlers, they're called, so it's mostly steel work. And it was Conor McGregor's SNC coach, a guy who owned Lacey, and he said he needed this equipment for next Sunday, and I was like, 
okay, yeah, we should be able to do that. So I just went to a, a fabricator in Coleraine and s took pictures of this equipment and said, can you make this? And he said, do you have engineering drawings? And I was like, what's an engineering drawing? Can you not just make it? And somehow he did, and me and my dad went down to Dublin that Sunday and loaded up uh, the car and trailer and delivered it. Important, to be honest, is, is quite easy in comparison to manufacturing. Um, I'm not from a manufacturing or engineering background, and to become try to become a, a world-class manufacturer has, has been a challenge. Um, but initially we were subcontracting out quite a lot of our work to subcontracting fabrication firms, but I like, I'm not control freak, but I just like to have control of our full process. So then we, I went to Belfast Met and went asked the head of welding there to give us his best graduate. And we bought uh, a welding machine off him for 400 pound. And uh, I paid, my friend was a technology teacher and I gave him two tubs of protein to do some engineering drawings because that was the currency of Black Box. Like some of our early staff joke, that was what we were paying them with was we actually were selling supplements at a stage and then we moved away from that because it was a very challenging industry. So we had a load of sports supplements and we had to get rid of them. So we just paid people and did contra deals um, for it. So. Made in Belfast is one of our strap lines. I feel creation transparency is hugely important. People want to know where their products are coming from. Belfast is a, a very good ma manufacturing heritage. Um, so yeah, my friend had a school uniform shop in the Ormor Road and I was living above it. And at the start, I couldn't even afford to pay rent there. So I worked in this uniform shop on a, at the weekend. And I just put a, a sign up um, and then yeah, people started coming to try and buy more equipment. Um, and then we moved to Twin Spires um, and signed a lease there. And we kept expanding and just rapidly outgrew there and then moved to Titanic Quarter in 2017. So yeah, Belfast I feel has got a very good brand. We've got quite a lot of products named after Belfast. We've got our Belfast bar. Ladies Belfast Bar, which is our best-selling barbells, and like the U.S. Army buys them, people buy them from all over the world, and they like the the brand. The bar we used to call it a 20 kg barbell, but like that's not aspirational. We changed it to the Belfast Bar, and within reason, it started to sell. So branding is, if you have a good brand, it's a huge asset. We've been through three rebrands, and when we changed to black box, it was a bit of a game changer for us. The start, it was called, and I cringe before I even say this, but it was a Elite Fitness and Performance, and that was back in 2012. At that stage, you know, we didn't know if it was going to be equipment or nutrition products so just kind of thought we'd keep it quite uh, holistic and then we somehow rebranded to EFP gyms we abbreviated it which was probably a step backwards and then we um, I think in 2014 or 15 I just knew this name was the least aspirational thing ever and I came out of established coffee shop on Hill Street and uh, drove past the black box, the musical venue, and probably had too many coffees, but thought that's quite a good name. So yeah, I texted to Miles from our team and he then abbreviated it. So that took out the ANC and it's a bit of a symmetrical logo. So yeah, it was done in house and, you know, I was nervous when we announced it, but yeah, it went down very well. and. To this day, a lot of people still compliment the brand. I'm a huge fan of bootstrapping. I, um, I think if you have a lot of money behind you and a lot of finance, I think you can get a little bit, I don't know if lazy, but you could potentially be a little bit wasteful. Whereas, you know, if you've got a very tight budget, um, I like the pressure. I think pressure is a privilege. Um, so I would encourage people when they're starting to bootstrap to an extent, but don't 
bootstrap so much that you can't get going with the business. Yeah, I think some of the, the bigger projects, the first one was when I was sitting in Normal Road actually, we got a, a purchase order from Brighton & Hove and I think it was about £140,000 and I literally fell off my seat when that came through. I didn't even know what a purchase order was. Um, but So that was a big confidence booster and for me what's so rewarding, I shared that with the team, is we're doing their new training centre again now um, this summer and their women, uh, women's team. And for me, it's probably one of the more rewarding ones because look, it's easy to sell and to sell once, but to maintain that relationship for the past seven or eight years, every year they come back to us, that's extremely rewarding. Um, we also, we did Adidas headquarters last year in Germany. And again, probably a bit of a confidence booster because Adidas is one of the biggest brands in the world. And at the start, we're going over to meet them and you're wondering, do we even have a chance here? Are we wasting our time? And then to win that project and deliver it on budget and actually a day ahead was um, pretty exciting. But equally, I'm picking the, the big names, but the business was built on looking after small business owners, amateur sports teams, and that still is a key part. Home gyms has obviously been a huge part for us as well. Your network is your net worth, and you know, when I started, I would have went anywhere to meet anyone, and my, my granny actually gave me uh, a cheque, I think it was like inheritance, it was like a thousand pound and I put, paid for a course which cost about fifteen hundred pound and at that time that was a lot of money. I probably should have mentioned at this stage I was in my overdraft from being a student for four or five years getting charged five pound a day. So to have that pressure of trying to get out of that, um, but I went to that course, um, it was a strength conditioning course and met a lot of influential people, S&C coaches, and if I was to connect the dots, the amount of business that's brought back in, you know, over the, the years. So I feel because we're interested in learning ourselves and you become friendly with these people and yeah, relationships is, is everything. Um, you know, digital marketing and e-commerce is important and it's obviously grown a huge amount in the past. 12 months, but equally never lose sight of relationships because um, that's ultimately how this business has been built. So yeah, the course I mentioned and I went to in 2012, um, we recently did the Irish Rugby Performance Centre in Abbottstown and ironically Nick Winkleman was the guy delivering the course. Uh, it was an American company athletes performance um, that were delivering the course and Nick then took the job with Irish Rugby I believe in about 2016 or 2017 and I just kept that relationship from them. My name is Nick Winkleman, I'm the head of athletic performance and science here at the Irish Rugby Football Union. When we look at the process of designing any gym, you have to look at the outcome you are trying to achieve. What is the, the purpose, the why of the space? And for us, we wanted it to be number one, a space people wanted to be in. We wanted it to be a space that screamed high performance, that screamed growth. Just by the nature of walking into this place, people thought, I'm on a path to improving. Second to that was the efficiency with which we could achieve that mission. So we knew the raw facts where it had to handle a certain amount of players. So that dictated how many racks that we had. And then from there, how do we position them in such a way to maximize space? And ultimately, Black Box has impressed every step of the way. From the direct support from Greg and his team on building the design. Uh, I don't know how many iterations of this gym we went through, but these individuals were as relentless as we were in getting it right. They never said no. It was solutions all the way through. When we look at the quality of the install and the follow-up to make sure every single seam, crease, and piece of equipment was where it should be, fit for purpose, they executed every step of the way. 
When you look at recommending a company, you know that you stack your credibility on top of theirs. And when I look at Black Box as an organization, from the people, the process, and the places that they physically build, to their follow-up and support, I cannot recommend Black Box highly enough. They are a major player in the fitness facility, gym facility space. They are here to stay, and I think they are an absolute value add to the overall world of high performance. PureGym was a, a big contract we won in 2017, I think it was, and PureGym, I'm sure most people know, but they're the biggest gym chain in the UK. They've over 200 sites, and they've actually got another, they acquired a company in Europe, so they've another 200. And for us, that was a phenomenal contract to one we win. We designed them a small functional training zone that they could put into every one of their sites. Been very lucky that we get a lot of repeat business and referrals. I think somewhere between 30-35% of our business comes through repeat business or referrals and again going back to my earlier point I feel the most important customer or client you have is the one you already have and if you can do a good job, deliver, do what you say you would do, um, they're going to refer or come back to you and thankfully that's probably one of the, the best things about working with Premiership football teams and other sporting teams is once you do the main gym you find a lot of the players then will get in touch for home gyms and we recently shared one with Jack Grealish we did a home gym and that came off the back of doing Aston Villa's new performance centre. Yeah, look, we've been through huge growing pains as a business. We, our sales kind of grow somewhere between 50 to 100%, maybe even sometimes more than 100% each year. And that can become a challenge, especially when you're manufacturing, coordinating installations in different parts of the world. Um, and yeah, th probably the last 12 months, probably have potentially been the m most challenging with the pandemic. Um, historically, 90% of our business would be sort of B2B, and I don't like using the terms, but for simplicity, I'll use it B2B. Um, and then probably less of our business was less than 10% was e-commerce. With COVID, then that totally flipped. And we're in this Amazon effect days where people want products in two or three days. And we didn't have the infrastructure in place. We were spread across four different buildings. We had machinery, but it wasn't to do the the amount of output that we needed so we invested a lot in our infrastructure last year with new machinery to allow us to get our lead time down from at some points it was actually up around four or five weeks we need to get that down to three four days if not less um, so and it's a challenge to make that investment a lot of companies maybe aren't willing to make that because you maybe haven't got the sales but for us to get the sales, you need to have this in place. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. We as a business need to come out of this pandemic a better company. And right now the pandemic's not over, but I definitely feel we have done that. Um, we used it to complete a lot of internal projects we were hoping to do. We invested a lot in new machinery. Um, and yeah, I think if you have that kind of growth mindset of willing to, you know, keep improving, it's going back to that 1%, I think that's hugely important. And look, we borrowed a lot from, I think Ryan, or Michael O'Leary at Ryanair, bought a lot of airplanes after 9-11. We invested quite a lot in machinery because a lot of these companies, they weren't getting any sales, so they were desperate for it. So I like to, Sig when others sag, you know, you don't want to be on the side of majority all the time. I like to, you know, a lot of companies were slowing down in the pandemic and that's when we want to speed up and grow quicker. The problem's not the problem, it's how you think about the problem and I think again it's just using failure as feedback. I think a lot of people and if you're going to be in business you're going to have so many mistakes, uh, upsets, people leaving you, potential people stealing from you, things going wrong, etc. And you need to get your mindset right and look at these challenges as 
almost good things. That sounds almost counterintuitive, but you know, we are growing very quick and we need people. People are making mistakes. I make mistakes every day, but we need to learn from it and improve. So I think it's just having that culture of, we talk about being 1% better. We want everyone as a company to be 1% better each day. So, you know, we're massive into habits. Like people think they need more discipline. Discipline's not the answer. It's having good habits. Um, so like start reading one page a day of a book or two pages, like don't try and read the whole book at once or run a marathon straight away. Um, and it's all about momentum, getting momentum going. Um, but for us, and I haven't touched on it, but culture is everything. And if we can protect the culture as a company and it needs to be developed, it's not set and forget. But if we can get the culture right and keep developing it, um, maintaining it, generally, you know, the rest of it, things will take care of themselves. Um, and people, you know, we've had a couple of people join and, and ask them what's the strategy, and we do have a strategy, but as I've said before, Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and if we can get the right bums on seats and the right seats, have the culture right, um, you know, I feel we're always going to be in a, an okay place. You know, success leaves clues, I feel. Um, you just want to find someone that's done something relatively similar and figure out how they did it. Um, and that's what I've done. Um, reached out to a lot of people in business and a lot of them will have time for you. So um, yeah, I'd encourage people to do that. Yeah, I try to read probably two books a week. Um, definitely over a hundred books a year, if, if not more. Um, yeah, my own kind of mortal morning routine, like get up kind of five. Recently, I probably haven't been getting up at five, maybe half five, but um, yeah, and just either do yoga, meditation. Um, we'll try and read for quite a period of time there with a the coffee, and then yeah, try and get maybe 90 minutes of focus work done. Um, I keep my phone in airplane mode from, and do not, disturbed from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, or sorry, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. just because, you know, we're in this age of we're hugely accessible, there's distractions, and I think focus is a massive thing. You need to be focused. Um, and I think for anyone that's potentially starting out in business, you know, I don't think you need, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you're very lucky, um, but you don't have to be totally passionate. I've been very beneficial or lucky that, you know, very into exercise, probably not as much as some of the other staff, but um, I, I feel if you're good at something and you can make a business out of it, then I think the passion will, will follow. But, you know, I just think sometimes people say, just follow your passion and sometimes that's, not always the best advice, but if you can do something you love, brilliant, um, but don't think it's the only way to do it. Don't spend too much time on a five or 10 year business plan because things will not work out the way you think, but just get going. And if you're gonna do it, go all in. And I know that's maybe not everyone's, but I just feel that to succeed, you have to, yeah, throw everything at it. Any of the best businesses I feel have been started through just having a pain and then just coming up with a solution and making it better. And I feel that's what we've done at Black Box. Uh, I was my own customer or client. Um, and then I just, you know, productively paranoid. I looked at the competitive landscape, both locally and internationally and studied them and yeah, took a lot of inspiration and then just put our own twist on it. So, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, um, especially not at the start. You know, once you become a bigger company, then you can start to spend more time on blue sky thinking and R&D. Um, and then probably finally, yeah, the ideas are a dime a dozen, you know, execution 
execution is everything. Um, you know, you, everyone's got ideas, um, and I'm all for coming up with ideas, but it's, it's executing on them is the, the key thing. Um, but the hardest thing is getting started, and it's a daunting experience, you know, putting up the first post on social media and sharing with people. Um, but, you know, just get going, get feedback. I wouldn't even spend too much time with family or people that love you because they're going to tell you your idea is great. You want to get out and get feedback from people that are actually writing the checks. You know, the, some of the best companies in the world were started in deep recessions. Black Box was started not far after, sort of 2008, 2009. Um, you know, rents are going to be cheaper, there's going to be more talent available. Um, and yeah, you know, people call recessions winters. Like it's a, winter's a great time to do it. So I feel there's no better time to potentially start a business and strongly encourage someone if they have that an idea to, to go for it.